and see. Oh, it's built already. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today we're doing the developer review roundup video, in which case I'm gonna answer the question, am I keeping this M1 Max MacBook Pro? And the answer is, yes, I am. Previously, when I tested it at the M1 systems, I used them and I didn't, I didn't keep them. I was like, my older system is actually more powerful than my new system. However, this time around, I'm actually pretty overall happy with the M1 Max and I'm definitely gonna be keeping it. The good things about the M1 Max is that it is cool, it is quiet, battery life, performance. It is, it is becoming a very, very, very nice system to develop on. Very, very nice. The fans, I don't hear them anymore. Not that fans are the problem, it's that the sluggishness that comes with the fans. Whenever the fans ramp up on the old system, the system will start getting a bit sluggish. So 1.4 and it's compiling shaders. I don't know what's going on because the temperature is normal. So there's something else overheating and I'm not sure what it is. So you have to disable turbo boost and do all these kind of like hacks to make it run well. Whereas with this system, it seems very stable. Now, because I'm keeping it, doesn't it mean you should upgrade to it because you are losing out a lot and I have had issues in the system. Yep. So computer just crashed again. It's a bit weird. Into Wi-Fi. It's Wi-Fi is off, but it tries to connect to Wi-Fi anyway, and then it's gonna crash. So there's a bit of response issues with this demo. Don't know what's going on, but I move the trackpad, and then a couple of seconds later, it registers. Very, 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 very. Why has the screen gone back? And then I'll just jump through the issues right now. So. When I'm using external display, I had flickering, so I had to plug in via HDMI and not via Thunderbolt 3. And it's plugged into HDMI. I've had audio crackling, so my even the actual, not just external speakers, my actual speakers would crackle. Plugins, I've lost a lot of plugins and development applications. You're gonna be losing all of that virtual machine legacy that you could have done on the old systems. You can't do that anymore. And I've had major crashes in applications. They haven't caught up yet. The system's great, but the applications haven't caught up yet. Don't know when they'll catch up. For example, in Unity, had that one crash where I had to like hold down the power button and force restart that system. And like I said, we're saying goodbye to all the virtual machines, saying goodbye to being able to boot into Windows natively. It's a shame, it's gone. But on the pros, I have managed to install all of my developer applications. I've got Apache running, I've got Brew running, I've got FFmpeg running, I've got, what have I got on system? I've got Visual Studio Code up there. I've even got Paralyze virtualizing Windows and I've got the latest version of Visual Studio on there right now and I've managed to build Unreal Engine 4 on it and it runs Unreal Engine 4. So I've got Unreal Engine 4, the Windows version being run inside a virtual machine and uh, I thought that was pretty cool. So I was very impressed with that. So everything now is a bit virtualized and that's the way development is going anyway. Docker, virtual machine, everyone loves that kind of situation. But so far I've been developing on it and I'm pretty happy with the performance, but comes with a loss because... It's gonna crash now, boom. Yeah, virtual machines are gone and it's not just Windows virtual machines that are gone. If you're a Mac developer and just say, you wanted to support a legacy application from High Sierra. You can't install the High Sierra virtual machine anymore. It's just completely wiped out into existence. You can't virtualize a virtual machine that requires x86. Redessa only supports basic sort of translation. And for productivity, I'm using it as pretty much a desktop computer right there. I've got a nice hub with all of the USB-A ports right there connected to USB-C. And I've got a nice stand, looks beautiful, makes it run nice and cool, connected to a nice, big, beautiful external display, keyboard, mouse, all that stuff. Seems to be working very, very well. That's a bit weird. Okay, I'll try unplugging all my peripherals and see if I can get it to avoid crashing. Just gonna run through all of the tests we've previously shown on this channel and just give a bit of commentary on it. So first up, I tried running a Chrome tabs test and I noticed that with massive amount of windows open, 
this M1 Max system was using less memory than my Intel system, using about four gigabytes less. Reason why is because on the Intel system, it has more cores, at least virtual cores. It has 16 virtual cores, whereas this one has 10 cores. And what applications like to do, especially if they're multiple threaded applications, they allocate more RAM because they need to feed each of the core as much data as possible. Just say, for example, you're compressing a file, you wanna give like, for example, 500 megabytes to each of the cores so the cores can just spin up and compress the files as quickly as possible. So you get 10 times 500, that's five gigabytes usage on this system, whereas on the other system it would be 16 times 500, which is eight gigabytes usage. So you're gonna find that you did need more RAMs on the older system, whereas the new system you'll need less RAM because it had less cores. That's one thing to notice. So when I was playing with Chrome, I noticed that, and it also ran pretty fast. It was faster on Chrome, used less memory than the new Chrome. Now, one of my other favorite things to do in life is just to annoy Chrome. So I'm gonna launch 57 tabs at the same time, see if you can handle it. Which one can handle the beast? They both can, because they're both pros. You can see the M1 Max, maybe it's ahead, side by side. You got the Intel one catching up. Which one's gonna win? We're looking at the circles on the screen right now. It looks like the M1 Max has loaded all the tabs at the same time. The Intel one is still chugging away. It's chugging at scale. So you're getting a lot better performance per tab. And if you have loads of tabs being open at the same time, loaded it all up straight away. Whereas the Intel one is still chug, 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 chug. That's not to say that Chrome is done and dusted because if you use Chrome or Safari without any form of ad, protection like and you go on a website like daily mail the daily mail 10 of those tabs 15 of those tabs can completely wipe out your system you'll be chug sitting away so the 10 core cpu is good but it's not like it's not able to handle daily mail so just make sure you have some sort of ad cookie sort of blocking situation there all right so we're right now in the game and we're getting 20 frames a second and on the M1 Max, I'm not hearing any fans and it's double the FPS. We're getting double the performance in Fortnite between the i9-5500M to this M1 Max. Other graphical tasks, OpenCL mining, we'll get actually the same mining performance on both. 10.3 mega hashes. And on the i9-5500M, zooming in right there, what does that say? It says 10.6. So mining hasn't improved. I'm looking into a metal mining solution, see what happens there. But yeah, mining is, is the same, so that hasn't improved. But game, gaming, you know, rendering, <laughs> that one's improved. So I'm just launching the infiltrated demo. That's pretty much the most aggressive demo you're gonna get in Epic's suite of samples. Now for the record, even though it's been about a year since Apple launched M1, the editor is still being compiled for Intel. Boom on the screen with Immolation. Immolation, this is an Intel application. It's already launched pretty much. This guy's still on 45%. It says five frames a second when we're moving the camera. And here, uh, it's like one frame a second. So it's five times faster in operation and faster in compiling. There's some tests launching Unreal Engine 4. Now Unreal Engine 4 is actually in Immolation. We're using Rosetta to translate x86 into ARM. And with that, it still ran better and faster on the M1 Max. So that was nice. Under emulation, applications were running well. So previously, where the i9 would always throttle down to its base speed, 2.2 gigahertz, M1 Max didn't notice any sort of slowdowns. It was just processing, compiling away, and still being able to perform better than before. Was able to also launch Unreal Engine 5, so that was pretty good, and it also launched it faster than on this system than the old system, so things have improved. SSD speeds have, had improved. One thing, actually, the four terabyte edition is slightly faster on the writing. It goes up to 7,000, thousand megabytes a second. Uncompressing, we managed to uncompress faster on the M1. Pretty much all the tests here, three, two, one. Let's unzip. Now this is a 44 gigabyte file and the fans have gone up to 2,900. So unzipping a file that started to make the M1 Max work real hard. I wanna jump into activity monitor, just see how much of the cores, look at our efficiency, performance cores, it's all being destroyed by unzipping. Unzipping just utilizes the chip to the max. Now, as you can see, all that to and froing, M1 Max did win after all. Unreal Build Tool, which is an EXE file, so it's actually running a Windows application using Mono to emulate Windows. 
And then <laughs> it's like lots of layers and then Rosetta is translating from ARM into Mono into Windows. So that's why it runs considerably slower. It beat the Intel chip compiling Intel code and it even started compiling the Unreal Engine code faster on the M1 systems than it would on the Intel systems. So pretty much all out obliteration on the new systems. We're gonna see, oh, it's built already. Four seconds versus eight seconds. Okay, what about the emulator? Emulator is up and the emulator is up. Android Studio, that one's now M1 compatible. Got the Android simulator up and running, compiled an NDK project. Worked as if it was completely working all well. So that was pretty cool. All right, now it's time to do some machine learning and it is almost done. So we got the result on the screen right there. And the Intel chip is slightly behind. So this is good because last time I tested the Intel versus the M1, the vanilla one, the basic one that came out last year, the Intel was actually faster. But now it's definitely lagging behind. Managed to run TensorFlow. We tried it out on a CPU and GPU. CPU and GPU speeds, that one ran pretty much the same speed, but compared to the older system, M1 did do TensorFlow, go with the flow. Film grain effects on the GPU. This guy, it just about, let's see if it does it, it just about handles six film grains, just about. Guess, guess how many film grains you can get on this M1 Max before it starts to complain. Still handling 25, handling 25. So from six to 25, that's how much they've improved the graphics in rendering. Final Cut Pro, of course, the GPU obliterated my older system. Previously, I could only get six film grain effects and it would just completely destroy this GPU. Whereas now I can get over 20. I got 25 in this test. HEIC files, oh, Instant, a bit slower. So yeah, even basic stuff like file system operations where you're quick viewing images, HEIC images, the compressed ones on my i9 system, it'd be a bit sluggish, a couple of seconds to view each image, whereas on the M1 ones, a lot faster. Hit play, 150 tracks. It's working the show, doing the magic. Can the i9 do 150? Oof. Nope. Logic Pro, we went from less than 99 tracks on the i9 to 150 tracks on the M1 Max. So it seems to be working well at 99 tracks, which makes the M1 Max 50% better at handling tracks in Logic Pro. However, this isn't a side-by-side, -side, is it? Oh, it overloaded. Okay, so it's less than 99. And it wasn't even a fair test because 99 tracks on the i9 would fan noise city and it would chug the system down insanely. So really it went from 50 tracks without fan noise city to 150 tracks, that's 3x improvement. So Jetstream number one. And to make this interesting, I'll do a battery life test at the same time. JavaScript completely destroyed that one in the test there a lot faster. As you can see, the M1's flying as usual. Battery life, 92% versus 100%. In Unity, I tried both versions of Unity, the x86 version, which was the newer version, and the ARM version. The ARM version ran the same test as my Intel machine at double the frame rate. A massive 120 frames a second. We went to 120 frames a second, and that was the limit of the refresh rate of the screen. So it was destroying it there. The issues that I had with Unity was, on the ARM version, when I ran that project, it just crashed the system completely. Four times as fast to run. It's a very, 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 very sexy platform. The only thing left to do is just wait for the applications to catch up and hopefully they will because it looks like Apple have smashed it out of the park. Why has the screen gone back? But overall compiling and using the editor, it was very, very slick to use. These issues will get fixed. Android Studio, I've got Unreal Engine, I've got Final Cut Pro, I've got 3D Mark 11. And when I tested out 32 gigabytes versus 64 gigabytes, I pretty much bombed each computers and I, I struggled to find any difference in performance. Now there was a difference. The 64 gigabyte system was using more memory. However, the 32 gigabyte system was just using more memory in compressed. So what I found was the whole compressing and uncompressing of RAM as and when you need it, you, you didn't notice a difference. Like 
I, I was using gigabytes and gigabytes and gigabytes, I had so many applications up and running, except the VM compressed RAM, that was the only difference. It would just compress more of the RAM and just uncompress it as it needed it. So I didn't get any bottlenecks like I did before back in the day when I was trying to use too many applications on the system. You can see that I've got some compressed RAM and I'm using the swap. So pretty much most of my memory is being used. And this is what it leads to. I've hit play, but I've got the spinny progress bar while it has to uncompress the project and put it back into memory. Have you wanted to improve your jawline depth? Now that that project's loaded in memory, it runs really fast. So I hit play and it appears on the screen. But if you do switch applications and have the Mac have to compress Final Cut Pro and then have to uncompress it back into memory, then playback. It literally, when you switch applications, you have to wait a couple of seconds for it to reload the data from the swap into the memory and then it'll be smooth again. I didn't get that sort of situation or Apple, Apple or any out of memory errors that I used to get in an older system where I didn't have enough RAM. And finally, in the Windows tests, I tested out running various, various versions of Visual Studio. Now you might think, oh, why not just get the latest one? Because if you're supporting legacy projects, I'm talking about old projects, some legacy projects, maybe you don't need to do it anymore. But sometimes I like to look back at my old projects and not having to go through the nightmare of going through and upgrading each project and finding out a bunch of errors. You, you can't, you can't do that anymore. I, couldn't, I wasn't able to install Visual Studio 2008. There's probably hacks around it. It's probably gonna work out eventually. I did manage to get Visual Studio 2010 going, so that was pretty good. And I did get the latest version of Visual Studio 2019 and 2022. And I even managed to compile and run the Windows version of Unreal Energy, of, of Unreal Engine on Parallels, a virtual machine, inside Windows and it was up and running. So that was very impressive. You can run some stuff, but I wouldn't recommend it for Windows development per se. But the fact that you can do some sort of damage is pretty good. So overall, I did also manage to get Apache running, Brew running, FFmpeg running. I got all of my development applications running. I got Node.js, all that kind of stuff. I'm happy with all of the work in progress that I've got running right there. So I'm definitely keeping this system, happy with the performance. What I'm unhappy with and I'm hoping will improve over time is just the support. I want the industry, the, the, the ecosystem around it to catch up to the before machine that they built. The only other thing I'd say is if you don't need to upgrade right now, there's apparently some sexy computers coming out next year. You got the Mac Pro, you got the iMac Pro, you got some, maybe an updated version of the Mac Mini and they might have like, you know, four M1 Max CPUs in there, not, not 10 cores, you could have 20 cores, 40 cores. So if you can hold out to the 20 core system or the 40 core system, you'd be flying with those. And it's a, a nicer setup than a laptop on a desk because if you ever try using a laptop with a monitor on a desk, you're gonna have to get yourself some, some external speakers because if you try putting the laptop underneath the monitor, you need to have the monitor go all the way up to the sky. It's very uncomfortable to use. So maybe having an iMac with a speaker system, 20 core CPU, 40 core CPU, you can have it mining in the background while you're doing some coding at work, making double money, I'm helping you out. So maybe hold out for that if you can. But I hope you guys found this video useful. Let me know what computer you're getting. Are you gonna get this M1 Max MacBook Pro? Are you gonna get the 14 inch or are you gonna hold out for the Mac Series Pros next year? Hope you guys found this video useful and enjoyed the show. Yep. So computers crashed again.